Thank you, Kayla. I was looking at some pictures this week. I, I'm preparing for that um, outsider tour in England. So I was looking for some pictures that I took, and I guess it was around 2007. And I found some pictures of Lydia and Kayla playing softball. And they were so little. It was, and of course, Lydia is still little. But uh, it was so fun seeing those pictures. And Becca, where's Becca at? She's here. She's downstairs. Becca actually looks like she was still sweet back then. She needed to to hear that. Somebody passed that on for me. Open your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 8 and get Isaiah chapter 42. Acts 8 and Isaiah 42. If you don't have a Bible with you, there should be one in under the seat in front of you. Be sure and grab that. You're going to want to be able to see this text. Isaiah chapter 42 and Acts chapter 8. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, help us as we study your word today. We're going to learn some amazing things about you that have been revealed in your word. And it also helps us to understand what we are to do. So, Lord, I pray that you'll help us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's start reading Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. We are continuing our series on the book of Acts called The Beginning of Our Story. And... <clears throat> Before we go there, I, I want you to remember what it said in Acts chapter 1, that, that Luke was writing to a man named Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Our faith, what we believe, is a matter of faith and practice. A church is defined by what it believes and what it does. There are a lot of churches that believe something, but they're not doing anything. There are a lot of churches that are doing things, but they don't really believe anything. But the, the Bible says that we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. And our faith is based on what Jesus did and what he taught, and then also through what the Apostle Paul did. But here, in this text, we're going to learn how God used Philip, and we're going to learn some things about the God of Philip. So let's look at chapter 8, Acts chapter 8. And let's start reading verse 26. Now, my last challenge to you, don't unplug your brain as we read this text. Because we're going to read through it once, and then we're going to learn some things about it. So really focus on the text. Verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, and eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet, read the Isaiah. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Then he said, How can I, except some man to guide me? He desired Philip, that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his hearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation... His judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet of this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities 
So he came to Caesarea. Isn't that an amazing account? So let's learn some things about the God of Philip. The first thing that I want you to see is that God is a God of divine order. God is a God of divine order. When God said how the gospel would be given, it said to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He came unto his own and his own received him not. The first people to hear the gospel were the Jews. Because, of course, it had been God's plan for the Jews to influence the whole world. That was God's plan. So God is a God of divine order. In Acts chapter 1, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so what did God do? The church began at Jerusalem and then it was scattered to Judea. And then in Acts chapter 8, Philip goes to Samaria. And now he's speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch. Hold your place here. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Some of you have seen this already, but let's understand God's order is not an accident. Go to Acts chapter 12. And here, the Jews have committed the unpardonable sin. They've attributed the work of Jesus Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, to Satan. And so from this point on, Jesus never speaks clearly to the Jews again. He speaks in parables and teaches specifically to his apostles. And here in this text, he's showing that now I'm going to move my focus for this age to the Gentiles. So, look at what it says in verse 38. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38. Then certain of the scribes of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, A holy and faithful people look for a sign. How many of you know Christians that are always looking for a sign? Anybody know some people like that? What does Jesus think of that? He said, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. That's Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Here's the sign I'm going to give you, Jesus said. I'm going to rise from the dead. i will be dead for three days and three nights, and I'm going to rise from the dead. And we've already seen the name Isaiah and now Jonah. That's just Greek pronunciation of the Hebrew name. That's the only reason it's spelled differently in your Bible. Look at what it says in verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment against this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment against this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth. Where did she come from? Ethiopia. So, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. How many of you think maybe God had a plan? You see, our God is a God of divine order. Go back to Acts chapter 8. So to the Jew first, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. This one's a fascinating one. Oh, just for the fun of it, let's go there. Put your ribbon here in Acts chapter 8. We don't have anything else to do today, right? Just study the Bible. Let's go to Genesis chapter 10. This one makes people nervous. Hey, can I tell you something real quick? So I drove to Somerset, Kentucky and back yesterday. My sister's father-in-law passed away suddenly, so I went down to the funeral. And I was driving back, I was listening to an interview that Joe Rogan did with Tucker Carlson. Now, how many of you think of, of either Joe Rogan or Tucker Carlson as your go-to Bible expositor? But Tucker was talking about how man is a physical and spiritual hybrid. And that's what, that's what has always been taught. He said, just like in Genesis 6. You know what's sad? Tucker Carlson, a man, I don't have any idea whether he's saved or not, believes the words of the Bible more than most fundamentalists. How about that? And this is another passage, Genesis chapter 9, Genesis chapter 10, that causes a lot of consternation in the world. 
But let's just read what it says. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. And this is always the order of their names. And so God gives a prophecy for Shem. Shem is the Semitic people. And then Ham. Ham is the, the people in the, the south of that region. And then Japheth, that's going to be the Europeans. So you have Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And that's the order all through the Scripture. The way that God reveals Himself is in that same order. Would that surprise you? Think about this. The Bible says that Shem, then you're going to have Ham. Ham's going to be the servant. And then Japheth, there, what's Japheth going to do? Japheth is going to live in the tents of those others. Japheth is going to take advantage of those other two. And that's the history of the world. That's us. And that's exactly what has happened in history. And so we have many examples of this. Abraham's three wives. His first wife was a Shemite. His second wife was a Hamite. His third wife was a Jacobite. That exact same order. What about the Synoptic Gospels? So Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is not a part of the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew is written to the Jews. Mark is written to the servant about the suffering servant. And Luke is written to the Greek. Shem, Ham, and Jacob. Everything God does is in that order. What about the preaching of the gospel? The preaching of the gospel. The first person, the first people that are preached to following the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the sending of the Holy Spirit, the men of Israel. Who's the second? Simon was preached to, but he didn't believe. Who's the next person the gospel received? The Ethiopian unit. Who's the next one? Cornelius of the Italian band. Shem, Ham, and Jacob. How cool is that? This is the order of Scripture. Um, oh, the crucifixion account. The crucifixion account is the Jews that are saying, crucify him. Who is it that carries his cross? Simon of Niger. And who is it that actually executes him? The Romans. Shem, Ham, and Jacob. You see it all through the Scripture. And we're seeing that same order here in the giving of the Gospel. So, the, our God, the God of Philip, is a God of divine order. So the Jew first, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But what else is God's order? Go back to Acts chapter 8. And look at what it says in verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired that uh, he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And so then what did he do? It says in verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read, verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. And what's that next word? You see, it's God's divine order that faith follows preaching. All right, go to Romans chapter 17. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. How many of you already knew I was wrong on that? Get this sermon. First amen in a long time. <laughs> All right, and look at verse 17. 
You know, I love it that he ties it with Isaiah again, just like our text, verse 16. But they have not obeyed, all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. What does the Bible then say? It says in verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in, they who, in, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It's God's order to give us the word, to give us preaching, and through the preaching of the word to generate faith, and that believing faith is what saves. Isn't that wonderful? This is God's book of divine order. And we're seeing it before it was written by the Apostle Paul. We're seeing it demonstrated in the ministry of Philip and the receiving of that ministry in the unit. So faith follows preaching, God's divine order. Then look at verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the unit said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, and Philip, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. You see, there's a divine order here that faith brings salvation, and following salvation is baptism. If you get, if you get that order out of whack, you're messing up God's divine order. It's vital that we see this. There's something else that it's so funny. I have pictures. I have books that, on the history of baptism. And there are pictures of Philip and the eunuch. And Philip went down in the water. Because they went down in the water. And then he picks up some kind of thing and sprinkles him. Did they have to go down in the water for him to sprinkle him? No, no. Baptism is always immersion in the Bible. It is always immersion. You might say, why doesn't the Bible say immersion then? Why does it say baptize? Because going all the way back to the 1200s in English, baptize meant immerse. That's what it meant. As a matter of fact, when the King James Bible was translated, the word immerse didn't exist, meaning to dip in water and bring back out. The other part of baptism that's very important, baptism is not only immersion. How many of you have been scripturally baptized? Would you raise your hand? How many of you are glad that the preacher brought you back up? Back up. Baptism is not only immersion. Baptism is the picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection is very important to us. Amen? Very important because of what Jesus did, and it's very important because we drowned. All right, so that's the, the method and the administration of baptism is outlined for us very well here. And this is God's divine order. Baptism follows salvation. And I love this part. So let's read verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Look at this. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, but the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Joy follows Scripture, obedience, salvation, and baptism. If you want to experience the joy of your Christian life, be obedient to God's divine order. If you want to be a miserable Christian, get outside of God's divine order. Amen? How many of you, you've got some instructions, You've got something you put together, and you've gotten it out of order. It might be that you got to put the back on a cabinet, and you realize too late that you've already attached the sides, and now the back won't fit. So you've got to take it all apart. Why? Because you messed up the order. And there's no joy in that. It's the same thing in our Christian life. If you want to have the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord comes through obedience. Obedience. And we see that joy. So, God is a God of divine order. To the Jew first, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Shem, Ham, and Japheth demonstrated in our text. 
Faith follows preaching. Baptism follows salvation. And joy follows scripture, obedience, salvation, and baptism. So God is a God of divine order. What else? Our God is a God of divine direction. He is a God of divine direction. Go back to Acts chapter 8 and look at what it says in verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go. In verse 27, and he arose and went. That's the way it's supposed to be. How many of you know that children are supposed to obey their parents? How many of you know that? How many of you fail to practice it? No hands went up. Look at this. You won't admit it. Here, I'm going to point some of you out right now. If you tell your children to do something and they disobey, you have not taught them obedience. And what does obedience require? It requires submission to an authority. And our problem is, we as parents don't want to be the authority, we want to be a friend. Well, let me promise you this. If you're the authority when they're young, you can be the friend when they're old. Jacob's going to come over to the house, and I'm going to tell him lots of stuff he needs to do. No, those days are done. We're going to have fun fellowshipping as friends. I'm still his father, he's still my son, but it's a different relationship than when he was sick. You see, obedience requires submission and authority. Here, we have a submissive servant being willing to obey his authority. And who is his authority? Who? There are two authorities here. Look at what it says in verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip. Who's that? That's Jesus. And then, look at what it says. In verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto him, Go near. So the initial command was from Jesus. Go down to Gaza. He didn't tell him what to do then. Go to Gaza. And then when he got there, the Holy Spirit said, do this. Isn't that cool? So he had an authority. Who's his authority? The Godhead. The Godhead. It's fascinating that the God of Isaiah, speaking about God the Son, is instructing him through God the Spirit. We have all of that right in our text. So there's an authority. So, God is a God of divine direction. God will direct a submissive servant. He arose and went. And then God directed him. This, I love this. Be, be honest with me. How many of you, you've been in a place where you really want God to tell you what to do? Here's what's interesting. Philip was already doing God's work. And God gave him a specific word. So here's God's divine order. Here's the way the Spirit directs. It's always from the general to the specific. From the general to the specific. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. How do I do that? I do that by dying to self. I start to get specific instructions in the Bible. But it's always from the general to the direct. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, and so he goes to Samaria and begins preaching. While he's preaching in Samaria, that's a general command. That's to a group. That's to a group of people in a location. And then it gets more specific. I want you to talk to this guy right here. This is the way that God works. The reason that many of us never experience the direction, the specific direction of God, is because we are living on our own. We are not fulfilling His general command. And here's the biblical word for His general command. His will. His will. God's will is the same for everyone. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Here's how you can begin hearing from God. Number one, repent. Repent of your sin. Repent of what you were believing about God. Repent of believing that you're good enough. Repent and believe. Repentance toward God. God is just. I'm not. Faith toward Jesus Christ. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. 
You see, that's God's will. It's God's will that you abstain from fornication. It's God's will that you pray always. There are specific things that are God's will. That's different than God's plan. How many of you, you know for sure that it's not God's plan for you to pass those great chapter six? You know that. Every woman in here needs to raise her hand. Some of you think you could do this. I can tell. And yet, that was God's plan for me. You see, there's a general command. I had to repent. I had to submit. There are certain things that I had to follow, and then God gave me His specific plan. Now, you, know, you guys know, I, I'm not a, I'm not a, a spiritual person. God didn't talk to me all the time. You ever been around somebody like that? I'm driving on the road. God told me to turn around. I've never experienced that in my life. And yet, 27 years ago, almost 20, yeah, 27 and a half years ago, the last Sunday of the last Saturday of November. When Laura and I were driving up I-75 and got to Fair Road, we knew this is where we were supposed to be. How do you know that? I don't have any idea. I don't know. I just knew it. That was God giving us a specific plan. Do I base doctrine on that? Of course not. And I certainly wouldn't apply that to you. Here's what you need to do. Church, you want to know what God wants you to do? Get on I-75 and get towards Fair Road. Do you see how people get crazy with this stuff? And yet, very important that we get this. God does have a specific plan for you. God does have people that He wants you to minister His Word to. But you'll never find out what that is if you don't begin serving Him. From the general to the specific, this is the way that God works. God will direct a submissive servant and God directed him as he was doing the work, and then God's direction moves from the general to the specific. And this is wild. You ready for this? Are y'all having a good time this morning? I'm so excited to teach this right here because it's very doctrinal, but it's also very practical. How many of you are glad that God is not bound by unfaithful servants? Wow. Listen to this. God's direction will move away from unfaithful service. So, what was God's plan? Jerusalem. Did God want the church at Jerusalem to do right? Did God want Jerusalem to turn to Him? Did they? Oh, Jerusalem, Jesus said, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you under my wings as a hen does her chick? And you would not. That's what God wanted. The man wouldn't do it. And so what did God do? He just gave up, I guess. I'm done with people. Nobody wants to believe in me. No. No. God's plan will continue. Why? Because He knows what you're going to do anyway. Isn't that, isn't that comforting? What a dead church. Isn't that comforting? He knows what we're going to do. All right. Now, go to, keep your ribbon here, go to Isaiah 42. And look at verse 5. Thus saith God, the Lord, He that created the heavens. Now, let me just stop right there. When God is describing Himself, almost every time He describes Himself as the Creator. Why? Because He has the prerogative to do with His creation what He chooses. Amen. There are Christians today that don't want to believe in a literal six-day creation. I, I, you can't get around that. Amen? He, he, he's the Creator. Okay, so again, verse 5, Thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. So look at what he said. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand. I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. 
to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Who is he talking to? Look at verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. This is what Jesus is going to do when he comes. This is the prophecy. 750 years before Jesus Christ came. This is the prophecy of who Jesus is going to be. Amen? And so, he's going to be a light to the Gentiles. And yet, look at Isaiah chapter 45. Oh, look at chapter 44. Isaiah 44, verse 1. Yet now, hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Israel, whom I have chosen. Chapter 43, verse 1. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formeth thee, O Israel. Remember the divided kingdom, Israel and, and uh, 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 Judah. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Look at what it says in verse 45. I'm sorry, chapter 45 and verse 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, in Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. He's talking about Cyrus there. But here is Jacob, Israel is God's elect. What was God's plan? For his elect people to be a city on a hill. For his elect people to not take their light and hide it under a bushel. It was God's plan for Israel, through their righteousness, through their holiness, through their worship of the holy God, to attract people to the God of the universe. But what did they do? They became a repugnant people. And they changed in two ways. They, they neglected this in two ways. Number one, they became so arrogant and proud of their national heritage that they rejected everyone else. Why did Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? Because he hated the Assyrians. He hated them. He hated them. Is there anybody you hate? Is there any race that you hate? Is there any nation that you hate? You're probably not going to want to go and evangelize them. They weren't supposed to behave that way. There's a second way. They didn't remain distinct spiritually and compromise their faith with those around them. So by the time Jesus Christ came, people had even stopped looking for the Messiah. They no longer believed that the words of the Bible were true. That's the problem. But that didn't stop God's plan. That never stopped God's plan. So, He is a God of divine direction. I love this statement. We do not frustrate the plan of God. How many of you know that whatever God says is going to happen? Here's the good news. You can be a part of it or not. You can be a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. We're going to see, we already saw in Acts chapter 8, earlier in our chapter, how Paul made havoc of the church before he was saved, and they went everywhere preaching the gospel. God used Paul to spread the gospel before he was saved and after he was saved. Paul didn't frustrate the work of God. Amen? God is a God of divine order, and He's also a God of divine direction, and He will direct your path. Is that what the Bible says? He will direct your path. But if you won't follow that path, His work is still going to get done. I love that. We can either have the blessing of participation or the shame of nothing at the judgment seat of Christ. So, He's a God of divine order. He's a God of divine direction. And I love this. He's a God of divine revelation. Okay, everybody go back to... Uh, okay, hold your place here. Get to Isaiah 53. And then we're going to go back to Acts chapter 8. This, this is really cool. So, in Acts chapter 8, Philip is walking along, and the Spirit says in verse 29, 
Then the Spirit said, Go unto, uh, said unto Philip, Go near, join thyself to this chariot. And I love this. A submissive servant, he ran. That's something when uh, Jacob and Lydia were little. We homeschooled. They were here at the church a lot. And um, when I would be counseling, doing some pre-marriage counseling or whatever, I would talk about obedience. And so we would allow Jacob to play video games for a short period of time. Was it 30 minutes a week? Was that, it was something? Jacob, what was it? An hour a week. That was the limit for video games. And so when he was playing a video game, that was serious time. And so I'd say, watch this. Jacob, come here. So he's down in the team room playing video games. And the next thing you would hear is Jacob running down the hall. There was none. Wait a minute. I got to get to the next level. That was not allowed. But immediate obedience. Immediate obedience. And we also taught them when I call, you run. Why? What if the house is on fire? What if there's a problem? When I call you, you run. What is Philip doing right here? You see it? Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, verse 30, and Philip ran thither to him. And he heard him reading. He heard him. He was reading it out loud. And what was he reading? Verse 32. The play of the, what's that next word? Do you think this Ethiopian eunuch had the original scroll that Isaiah wrote? How many of you think he probably did not? So what was this thing? It was a copy. That's not a hard word. What was it? What did God call the copy? Oh. So when you have a doctrinal statement that says all Scripture was given by inspiration of God in the original autograph, and then I saw a, a, a handout from a Bible college that said inspiration doesn't extend to copies or translations. So then this was not the inspired word? Well, according to the Bible it was, because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Is that what the Bible says? Does the Bible just call this Scripture? Was what Philip was reading? Was what the eunuch was reading? Was it inspired Scripture? Huh. And yet we're the weird ones. Why? Because we just believe it. We believe what the Bible says. God is a God of divine revelation. So let's go to Isaiah 53 and let's read the text that he was reading. It's verse 7. Isaiah 53 and verse 7. And of course, as we learned from Dr. Vance this week, there were no verse numbers when it was written, but I'm thankful that we have the verse numbers so that we can find it. Verse 7. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. So let's go back to Acts chapter 8. Verse 32, the place of the Scripture which he read was this. Drop down to verse 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? So, what we see in this text is that God is a God of divine revelation. Here's what's really fun. Are you ready for this? I love this. This was written 750 years before this. By this point, 780 years. 790 years. But here's what we know. That Scripture still existed. And it was being read, and the Bible still calls it Scripture. That's the divine preservation of Scripture. So, it was still available, and here's what I love. It was still true. And it was still about Jesus. How many of you thankful that He was wounded for your transgression and bruised for your iniquity? It, 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 it's still true. But here, 
don't miss this. It still needed to be explained. Understand this now with our reading? There's a big move to try and make the Bible easier to understand. It has to be explained. The Bible has to be explained. But Peter said of Paul's writings that in them are, are some things hard to be understood. If you make Paul's writings easy to be understood, they're no longer Paul's writings. You're giving a commentary on it. And there's nothing wrong with giving a commentary on Scripture, but a commentary can never replace the Scripture. If you want a commentary, buy a commentary. If you want a Bible, buy a Bible. They're not the same thing. Of course, the best commentary on Scripture is Scripture. We allow the Bible to explain it. But remember, this was written in 750 B.C. It was still available. It was still true. It was still about Jesus. And it still needed to be explained. But not only that, but this is true of verse 37 also. Look at verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So, that verse is removed from every modern Bible. That verse is the best verse on believer's baptism in the Scriptures. It's the best verse. Hey, here's water. Why don't you baptize? Philip said, no, no, there's something that has to happen first. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. We learn a couple of things about baptism through that. Number one, baptism follows salvation. Number two, there has to be an understanding of the gospel. Was anyone here baptized as an infant? You're back. Hold your hands up. Hold them up. Okay, Amanda. What do you remember about that? Was this a, was this a profound move of God in your life? She cried. I'm sure every one of you cried when you were baptized as a baby. See, here's the thing. That's not biblical baptism. Why? Because faith must precede baptism, and there must be a confession of that belief. So, when someone comes forward, they want to get baptized, I, I stand here with them at the front of the church, and I say, have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? You have to confess that out loud. Every once in a while, you'll have some smile. What if they can't talk? Well, then they'll nod their head. There has to be an acknowledgement of the truth. This is not optional. And yet, that's removed from every modern translation of the Bible. Now, we use this statement a lot, the historic Christian faith. There are things that Christians have always believed. That is the historic Christian faith. And it's vital that we never disconnect from that. But if Solomon said it this way, there's nothing new under the sun. Amen? When God revealed it, when God was done with his revelation, which is those 66 books of the Bible, when God was done with that, he's done revealing. Amen? And that's where our faith, they continued in the book of Acts, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Doctrine is God's truth and God's word. So the Bible is our sole authority. Creeds and confessions are not our authority, but creeds and confessions were statements that defined what all Christians believe. Right? So the historic Christian faith has been identified in, in documents through the years. I've got a couple of those documents here. So, in 1678, a group of Baptists in England put together a statement of faith. And here on this, they're talking about baptism and the scriptures that they use to talk about baptism. One of them is Acts 837. So, this Baptist confession from 1677, they believed Acts 837 was in the Bible. This is the historic Baptist faith. Then, 1689, William III became king. When William III became king, there was a certain amount of religious liberty that was granted in England. 
So Baptists got together. They had already uh, produced the 1644 Confession of Faith, signed by William Kiffin and some others. In 1689, they got to produce it, and they actually were allowed to hold church services after 1689. Now, Kiffin had been holding those church services since 1644 and before. It just wasn't legal. Now it was legal, so they got together in a big conference and they produced what's called the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689. And here it is. On the 29th article of baptism, baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ to be unto the party baptized a sign of his fellowship with him, speaking of Christ, in his death and resurrection of his being engrafted into him, of remission of sins, and of giving up to God through Jesus Christ to live and walk in newness of life. Isn't that a blessing? And then, paragraph two, those who do actually profess repentance for God, faith in and obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ are the only proper subject of this ordinance. And listen to the two verses that they list. Mark 16, 16, and Acts 8, 36, and 37. Mark 16, 16 is removed from every modern Bible. Acts 8, 37 is removed from every modern Bible. How many of you think that's an accident? These are the things that make our faith distinct from other Christian denominations. And so what there will be is there'll be a, a footnote, like I was reading uh, my commentaries for this text this morning, for this message this morning, and uh, at verse 37, they say that that passage is only found in certain late manuscripts. And by late manuscripts, around 500 A.D. That's not very late. And what I'd like to know is how many manuscripts there are before 500. There's just a couple. Why do those still exist? They weren't used. So what are the texts, what are the manuscripts that remove Acts 8, 37? Now, of course, the numbers weren't there, but that passage, they removed that passage. Imagine this. It's Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, and Codex Alexandrinus. And then... Just a very, there are just a very few papyrus that exist. And here's P45. So P45 doesn't have Acts 837, and neither does Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, or uh, Alexandrinus. And yet, Vaticanus doesn't appear in any record of any kind until it was found in a catalog of the Vatican Library from about 1475. Codex Sinaiticus wasn't discovered until 1844. It wasn't copied until 1859. It wasn't photographed until 1910. Codex Alexandrinus was given by uh, the, the Patriarch of Constantinople to King James I in 1525. It didn't get there until 1527, and he was already dead. Charles I was the king, and he had other problems, like his head was cut off. So this wasn't used. So are you telling me that the God of the Bible... The God has promised to preserve His Word. The God who has said man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That God hid the truth of believers' baptism, which is a third of the Great Commission for Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We're supposed to go and preach, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then, in Mark chapter 16, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be condemned. All of that was hidden? Or it was just put in there? We don't really need that. But he didn't reveal that until 1910? Is that the God of the Bible? Honestly. Is that the God of the Bible? But is there any evidence for Acts 8, 37 in existence before Sinaiticus and Vaticanus? Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, they say that they date to around 350, 350 B.C. I'm sorry, 350 A.D. Well, Irenaeus wrote a book called Against Heresy around 177 A.D., and he quotes Acts 8, 37. 
Cyprian wrote a book around 258, and he quotes Acts 8.37. Now, how many of you know that 177 and 258 is before 350? Can you all do that math? Why would you want to remove it? Seriously. The other thing is, it's in the majority of manuscripts. Most manuscripts have it. So why would you want to remove it? Well, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to impugn some character. But clearly, you don't believe God preserves his word. Amen? Clearly, believers' baptism is not significant for you. So then why is it that we have modern Baptists that believe that that verse is supposed to be in their Bible? Because they're believing some bad information. And let's just be honest. They, are, they, they do not have a faithful view of Scripture. And they clearly do not hold to the historic Christian faith. So that 1689 London Baptist Confession, it's kind of a baptized Westminster Confession of Faith. The Westminster Confession is almost word for word the same as the London Baptist Confession of Faith. As a matter of fact, what it says about the Scriptures, it's in chapter 1, section 8 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. It says that God, through His divine providence, has kept His word pure in all ages. That's the historic Christian faith. Do you know what it says in the, 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 the London Baptist Confession of 1689, chapter 1, section 8? That God's kept His word pure in all ages. What did they believe? That God has kept His word pure in all ages. How many of you believe God's kept His Word pure in all ages? Of course you do. That's the historic Christian faith. Why don't modern, confessional Christians hold to that? Because they don't hold to the, to the historic Christian faith. God is a God of divine revelation. He is also a God of div- divine preservation. Amen? We actually have the Bible. We can preach it. We can believe it. And here it is. So, the God of Philip. He was a God of divine order. He's a God of divine direction. He's a God of divine revelation. But I love this. He's also a God of divine mercy. You see, we're seeing a shift. How many of you, you are an American, as in the United States of America? You're an American. How many of you, it's becoming more difficult to be proud of that? Right? So here's what we understand. In the New Testament, God doesn't deal with nations. He deals with individuals. So, Acts chapter 2. Ye men of Israel. What happens here? One man. So, God moves. His mercy is being demonstrated to an individual. But not just any individual. A black man. What is God telling us? That salvation is no longer national and it's no longer connected with any race. Salvation is individual. And His mercy is extended to an individual. Here's what I love about this. He moves supernaturally for one man. Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God direct Him to one man. He moves supernaturally for a black man. He moves supernaturally to demonstrate that salvation is not only for one race. Salvation is of the Jews, is that what the Bible says? But not only for the Jews. Praise God for that. God's not done with the Jews, but now, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Brother Vance mentioned that this week. So, he's a God of divine order. He's a God of divine direction. He's a God of divine revelation. And he's a God of divine mercy. But he is also God that gives divine joy. Joy follows divine order. Joy follows divine direction. Do what God tells you to do. How many of you, you know that God wants you to do something, you didn't do it, and you really should have? Any of you? You ever experienced that? Yeah. Yeah. Joy follows divine order. Joy follows divine direction. Joy follows divine revelation. How many of you ever thought God wanted you to do something and He really didn't? Because you didn't get it from the Word of God. Joy follows divine revelation. And praise God. Are you thankful you say? Joy follows divine mercy. I hope that you're saved today. If you're here this morning and you've not placed your faith and trust in Christ, you're just under divine judgment. The Bible says, He that believeth not, not will be condemned, but is condemned already. 
God has already judged sin. He judged that sin on the cross. And you can, you can be a part of Christ's sacrifice. Or you can pay for it yourself. Aren't you thankful for divine mercy? Have you learned something about the God of the Bible today? Amen. Let's all stand together. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to preach it. Lord, thank you that you have preserved it and that we can trust Acts 837 and that we understand your divine order, even if the religious world does not. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Thank you, Lord. And I pray if there's someone here who's not born again, that today will be the day of their salvation. With every head bowed and every eye closed, how many of you know the will of God? How many of you know that? You know what the will of God is. Who here, you're in a place where you really need to discern His plan for you? Raise your hand around the room. Amen. Amen. Well, we've learned from Philip how God does that. Let's sing this together.